it's recording. Well, hello and welcome to the APSA after school session on political parties and the 2016 presidential election. My name is Barry Burden. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and I'm director of the Elections Research Center, also at the University of Wisconsin. Glad to be with you, and I appreciate you taking your time uh, during this busy school year and election season uh, to think a little bit about political parties generally and the role that they're playing in this particular election year, which is not typical in a number of ways, as you're going to see. Uh, so I've got a series of slides to talk through with you, and, um, and I, I hope it'll be helpful as you think about interacting with students during this election campaign to put what they're seeing this year, uh, which might be the first presidential election they're really paying serious attention to, into some broader context. So let us start with a little bit of that context. In thinking about what a political party is, what do we mean when we use that term? Uh, both what it is and what it isn't, uh, and what that means we ought to be looking for when we think about political parties. Well, there are a couple of definitions that political scientists have offered in recent years that I think are helpful just for orienting this discussion. Uh, one comes from John Aldrich's book, Why Parties, which is now a, a classic in the field. Uh, he suggests that parties are really a team of people, a team of politicians in particular, and that these are politicians who are trying to hold office, win office, and re-win office. So in his view, parties are not uh, people on the street or rank and file followers, or even necessarily donors or activists. These are really people seeking office or, or wanting to be close to those in office. And those people realize that there are some advantages from coordinating their activities. And so they form collectives, these are political parties, uh, to solve those coordination problems uh, those problems might be how to organize themselves in the legislature once they're, once they're elected, how to nominate candidates for various offices and, and coordinate that activity of office seeking. Uh, so there are a variety of coordination problems that parties solve for politicians, which makes them willing to enter into these teams. Uh, what I think is a complementary view comes from a book that's also gotten a lot of attention this election year, especially during the nomination season. And that's a book by Cohen and his authors called The Party Decides. And they suggest there's a second group of people we need to think about, uh, not just politicians, but also a series of activists who have real policy demands. These are people who care about the direction of government, have a philosophy, want to see it enacted. Uh, they may be organized around uh, specific issues or around a grand philosophy, but they want to push government in a particular direction and only politicians can do it for them because politicians are the ones who are in office and can make policy. And so the politicians end up wanting to hold office, but sort of working on behalf of these uh, policy seekers. And this large unwieldy group of people, both people in office, those seeking office, and then the outside activists have to make some compromises in order to keep the coalition together and keep control of government. It's a difficult task. And it's a messy organization. In, in fact, it's not really an organization. It's a, it's a series of networks that connect people to one another. So those are a couple of scholarly views that I think just help provide a little bit of a backdrop. We might also think about what parties are not. Uh, they are not mentioned in the US Constitution. In fact, the founders of this country uh, feared political parties and other factions and interest groups that might form and take control of government. And, and our separation of powers and checks and balances that are so familiar today are partly built to prevent a party from having too much control in office. Uh, nonetheless, they emerged very quickly after the nation's founding, and we've had a strong two-party system for at least 150 years. The other thing that parties are not are, are just the formal organizations that you might see sitting in office buildings in Washington, D.C. When we say party, we don't mean just the Republican National Committee, or the Democratic National Committee, or the state parties. It's really a complicated network of office holders, campaign activists, donors, lobbyists, uh, formal organizations, uh, people who are part of the conversation within a party. Uh, it, it, it's, it's difficult to get our hands around, but I think it's worth remembering that it's 
it's a diverse group of individuals both in and out of government. So with that in the way of backdrop, let's move ahead and think about uh, 2016 and what it has to say about political parties. And I wanna start at the beginning of the nomination process. This is where parties are most active in choosing their own nominees for president through an internal process. And this year uh, was strange for both the Democrats and the Republicans in terms of the fields of candidates who actually ran in 2016. I wanna walk you through that for both the Democrats who are on the left side of the screen and the Republicans who are on the right. The Democrats had an unusual nominating season in that the field of candidates was small and very lopsided. Only about half a dozen serious Democrats ran for president this year. Some of them, frankly, didn't have much of a shot given their backgrounds and records within the party. And it very quickly became a two-person race between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. As you know, that contest went on right through the last primaries and caucuses and was even an issue still at the Democratic National Convention. Uh, but this is really an unusual dynamic to have an open seat where a president is stepping down and uh, the party is free to nominate whoever it likes to really coordinate behind two candidates uh, so quickly in terms of voters uh, is pretty unusual. It, it doesn't look like the open fields we typically see. Uh, they often bring eight, nine, 10 candidates uh, into the field to give it a serious go. This year was essentially one and a half to two candidates on the Democratic side with Hillary Clinton really looking almost like an incumbent president or vice president, kind of the heir apparent for the party. And that actually made things tougher for Clinton than it could have otherwise been. She might have preferred a, a bigger field where it was her and her stature against a wide range of also runs, uh, but that one-on-one -on -one race uh, obviously gave her a lot of difficulty right up through the end of the nomination season. The Republican side of the ledger on the right-hand side of the screen is exactly the opposite. This is a field that is historically large, 17 candidates at one point who are serious contenders, former governors, people from business, senators, uh, others who have run before, um, I, th I think a whole range of credible candidates, uh, but just a larger set of candidates than we'd ever seen. Uh, that, is, as you're gonna see, reflects partly divisions within the Republican Party, um, it reflects maybe the lack of a front runner who could dominate the process early on, even though there are a couple of candidates there who look like real establishment candidates who might have played that role. Uh, in the end, that large field probably helped lead to the nomination of Donald Trump. He did not win more than half of the vote in many of the primaries and caucuses he entered, and most of them, in fact, until the very end. But the fractured field, a field this large, and one where the vote is divided, allows a candidate, even who was only winning 10, 20, 30% of the vote, uh, to continue to ride near the top of that wave, and uh, in Trump's case, eventually become the nominee. So I think this process would have worked very differently in both parties had we had the standard number of candidates and kinds of candidates we see in most presidential nominations. On the Democratic side, Hillary Clinton in a standard year probably would have had an easier time of it uh, in terms of winning primaries and caucuses. And on the Republican side, we may not have ended up with Donald Trump as the GOP nominee had the field been six or seven Republicans rather than uh, 16 or 17. So the field is certainly unusual this year and not what you'd expect from political parties in most contemporary presidential election years. A related uh, factor to think about is the endorsement patterns for these candidates. We talked early on about parties being loose networks of people who are connected to the party establishment and to politicians. Uh, many of these people aren't officially in office as Republicans or Democrats. They're people who have worked within the parties, given money. Uh, in some cases, they're celebrities who have been attached to the parties. Uh, but they play an important role because they are able to coordinate activity around candidates and help winnow the field from many to a few. In most years, we see patterns of endorsements by these people lead very quickly to the eventual nominee. There's a sort of uh, rallying or circling of the wagons among these endorsers that, that point in the direction of where the nominee ought to be. And that's typically around the person who's acceptable to the widest number of elements within the party. So I wanna show you that the endorsement patterns also look very different for both the parties in 2016. 
So the figures I'm showing you here, again, Democrats on the left, Republicans on the right, are from the website 538, very useful resource in the classroom for showing um, particularly how, how the data play out in this year's election. So let's take a look at the left-hand side of the screen as a starting point. There you'll see endorsement patterns for Democratic nominees uh, over the last several presidential elections, starting about a year before the Iowa caucuses, so almost two years before election day, and running right up through the conventions. And what that scale is measuring is the total number of endorsement points that a candidate earns. In, in the 538 calculation, a candidate earns some points every time they get an endorsement from a governor, from a senator, from a member of the House of Representatives of their party. And those tally up over time and can be compared across candidates and across time. And you can see that the candidates who won the nomination in each of those years slowly built their endorsements over time. They gathered support from people within the party. Uh, Al Gore in 2000, who was the Democratic nominee that year, uh, starts building endorsements, gathering those a year before the first voting. Six months out, he begins to build a substantial lead over the other Democrat, really Bill Bradley, who ran that year, and begins climbing until he's in a, a really superior position by the time the first votes are cast in Iowa and New Hampshire. Uh, the, the more typical pattern is for the other candidates you see there on the Democratic side. Bill Clinton in 1992, Barack Obama in 2008, Mike Dukakis back in 1988. It takes them a while to gather enough endorsements. It takes a while for the party regulars to figure out who they want to support. In some of those years, there were some strong other candidates running, John Edwards, Jesse Jackson, Paul Songus, a variety of other Democrats who gave it a serious run. But in the end, especially as voting begins in those first events in Iowa and New Hampshire, you see the endorsers come around and, and those blue lines jump upward until those candidates are uh, in the first position. So what makes this year different for the Democrats is that Hillary Clinton was in essentially that position, not when the Iowa caucuses took place, but a full year before. Her score on this measure is where uh, Mondale and Dukakis and John Kerry were a year later. Just a very dominant performance. A candidate who was wrapping up endorsements from party regulars, again from Democratic governors and members of Congress, in a way that no other Democrat in the modern era has. Uh, she looks like essentially a president running for re-election or a vice president who's taken up the mantle of the, of the party. Uh, and Sanders, who's not shown there, uh, at least not explicitly, he's the dark blue line at the bottom, had a very difficult time earning endorsements from leaders within his party. So just a substantial gulf on that side uh, that doesn't quite reflect what the voting was like in the primaries and caucuses, but do help explain why she uh, eventually got the nomination. Now switch from there to the right-hand side of the screen where we have the nomination patterns for the Republicans, again from about a year before the Iowa caucuses until the first voting happens in uh, the beginning of the campaign year. Republicans generally show the same pattern of building endorsements over time, though they do it a bit faster than, Republic, than Democrats do. They, they tend to circle the wagons and identify a leading candidate who they're willing to unify around, typically a little faster than the Democrats do. Uh, you'll see that with George W. Bush in 2000, that pattern was especially strong. He was gathering endorsements, uh, particularly from Republican governors at a fast clip that year, very early on, and uh, vaulted ahead of the field uh, months before the first voting took place. But it's also true of Bob Dole, who won the nomination back in 1996, somewhat less true with the others, such as Mitt Romney and John McCain. Um, so, so there are some similarities between the parties in terms of building endorsements over time, but also a, a, a little faster pace for the Republicans. They tend to be a little more in agreement about what kind of person they want as a nominee. Now, look at how 2016 differs from that pattern. You'll see Donald Trump is at the bottom of the screen in the lower right. He had essentially no endorsements from any Republican governor or any Republican member of Congress a year before the voting took place, six months before the voting took place, even on the eve of the Iowa caucuses in New Hampshire primary, when the Republican field had already started to winnow and some Republican candidates had gotten out of the race, there were still almost no elected officials at the federal level or statewide level who were endorsing Donald Trump. 
Uh, some of the other solid lines you'll see there that aren't labeled are people such as Jeb Bush, the former governor of Florida, and Marco Rubio, senator from Florida, who did gather some endorsements, particularly as the voting got underway, uh, but never reached the levels of the other front runners and were only marginally ahead of Donald Trump. So the difference between the parties couldn't be clearer than it is in 2016. For the Democrats, party leaders very quickly decided she should be the nominee and they rallied around her early and enthusiastically. And on the Republican side, it's not as though Republican officials decided to endorse other candidates or that they were divided among the many 17 candidates running for the nomination and that some of them circled around Rubio and some of them around Carson and some of them around Ted Cruz. It's essentially that Republican leaders decided not to endorse anyone this year. A large number of Republican senators didn't endorse any of the presidential candidates. And uh, the few that did, did it late and in a kind of sporadic fashion. So Donald Trump, you're gonna see is the exception to the rule in a number of ways. And this is a prime one that political scientists would look at. Uh, the inability or the unwillingness of the party to, to consciously choose a nominee to do that actively this year and to essentially allow Donald Trump to become the nominee without really any support of the, of the elected officials in his party. So that's the pattern of endorsement. That's one of the ways we look for a functioning party. And here, good evidence that the Democrats were organized and in widespread agreement, and very little evidence that there was much coordination going on among Republican elected officials in 2016. That lack of coordination among the Republicans reflects I think some newly developed factionalism within the Republican Party. Political scientists used to think it was Democrats who were the factionalized party. You might remember Will Rogers' famous quip that he didn't belong to an organized party, he was a Democrat. And that was the joke that seemed to be true through much of the 60s, 70s, 80s, even into the 1990s. Democrats having an old fashioned labor base within the party, a new set of activists who were interested in uh, the environmental issues and abortion issues and other kinds of cultural things and real difficulty in putting those factions together. And that often showed up in the nomination process for Democrats. But things have flipped in an important way in just the last couple of election cycles where Democrats have essentially been able to paper over a lot of those divisions and successfully nominate candidates and win national elections. Whereas the divisions among Republicans have uh, really appeared and I think multiplied in a way we would not have expected. This is one take on those divisions, again from 538. This is their version of what they call a five ring circus, representing five large categories represented within the Republican Party. These are categories that have really just emerged and separated you know, in the last decade or so. In the, uh, in the center ring, up in the middle, is the, uh, the Republican establishment. These are the old guard Republicans, uh, people who would have been typical Republicans uh, 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, people like Lindsey Graham, the senator from South Carolina, is there. Uh, uh, Bobby Jindal is on the edge of that group, the gov former governor of Louisiana. Uh, Jeb Bush, the former governor from Florida, all within that group, sort of mainstream Republicans, um, for lower taxes and less regulation and a, a stronger military, the kind of standard things that Republicans have stood for over the years. And that's where a lot of those dots are. A lot of the candidates who ran in 2016 found themselves in that center group. And we might have expected the Republican Party to circle around someone there. Scott Walker, Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio all looked like promising candidates who could appeal to that group and probably other groups within the party. Uh, on the upper left are what 538 calls moderates. These are people who are a little more centrist within the party. John Kasich, who did uh, well and hung on to the end of the primary process is there. In the upper right, you have the evangelical Christian conservative wing of the party. A very prominent part of the Republican Party in the early 2000s has waned a little bit in this cycle, but had a couple of representatives in Mike Huckabee and Rick Santorum in 2017. And then down at the bottom of the screen, you have the libertarian wing represented by uh, Rand Paul, the senator from Kentucky, who ran this year. And uh, in the lower right, for lack of a better term, sort of the Tea Party wing of the party that's emerged in the last few years. And Donald Trump is there if he's anywhere. He, he really does not fit the pattern of any of the archetypes within the Republican Party, but 538 places him there for lack of a better place. It, it's unusual that the party would 
choose to nominate someone so far from the center of these five rings. You might have expected at the outset of the process that someone like Rick Perry from Texas or Scott Walker from Wisconsin would have done well because they are in the, the, the center of this spectrum and have appeal to at least two or three wings within the party. Trump at best early on looked like he had appeal to just one of the circus rings in the party um, and somehow managed to win the nomination. And it, it may be in fact that he is different from the other candidates and that the field was so large that those things enabled him to become the nominee. And it go back to go back to my earlier point that in a smaller field, it might not have been the case that Trump would have walked away with the nomination. Were there only two or three candidates in that, in that sweet spot in the middle, just uh, Scott Walker, just uh, Jeb Bush, uh, it might have very quickly uh, resulted in a two or three person race where Trump would have, would have had real difficulty early on. But that's obviously not what happened. So these factions within the party are really an important part of the process and are, I think, part of the explanation for what happened this year. They are a new thing for the Republicans to wrestle with and I think will continue to be an issue for the Republican Party even after the election, win or lose. So factions are an important part of what happened in 2016. Now, because Donald Trump is an unusual candidate, uh, he earned the nomination in an unusual way he ends up running a general election in an unusual way. Uh, it just highlights some of the things you probably already know about his campaign. He, he raised almost no money during the primary process and yet defeated 16 other candidates. He had no endorsements from Republican governors or Republican members of Congress. We've already talked about that. He essentially got attention through rallies and free media or what campaigns call earned media. Uh, he was an adept user of Twitter as a platform to grab attention and to change the narrative on the campaign trail. Those things worked wonderfully for him in the nomination process. But what he's discovering now in the general election process is that some of the things he lacked uh, during the primaries and caucuses are liabilities in the general election. And in particular, I would point to the use of surrogates on the campaign trail. Surrogates are people who can stand in for the candidate who can help spread the message wider than a candidate can do on their own, uh, traveling from state to state, uh, who can help build on the field operations that exist and the advertising strategies that exist uh, to make the, can the, the campaign multifaceted. And often these surrogates appeal to different subgroups than maybe the candidate themselves would. Because Trump had no nomination, no endorsements rather, from Republican governors or members of Congress, and there are still many Republicans who are reluctant about campaigning with him or formally endorsing him. He essentially has no help on the campaign trail. I want to give you an example of this. This is the calendar of surrogate appearances in Pennsylvania over the course of one month during this campaign. Pennsylvania is an important swing state. It's a place where the candidates have spent a lot of time and money. And so I think it's a good indicator of more generally what this process looks like. So here's the month of September. Uh, and these are appearances either by the presidential and vice presidential candidates themselves or by some key surrogates. So you'll see that Hillary Clinton made an appearance in the state, but so did her husband on her behalf uh, on Friday the 9th. Uh, Barack Obama appeared there on behalf of the Democratic ticket. Uh, Tim Kaine, her running mate, Joe Biden, Michelle Obama, even Bernie Sanders trying to help win back some of his supporters to the Democratic ticket. So it's possible for her as a candidate to have uh, Clinton rallies in specific places and to be running advertising and to have field operations, but also to send out her daughter and husband and the current president of the United States to campaign on her behalf. And in some states, the, uh, those surrogates are actually more popular, more appealing than she is. And so it's, it's a really effective way to reach a lot of voters. But contrast that with the Trump schedule. He made multiple appearances in the state during September. It looks like four trips. His running mate uh, appeared in the state at least once, but that's it. It's essentially the two of them campaigning on behalf of the ticket with really no one else to speak for the party. And that's a consequence of the nomination process and the way that Donald Trump managed to win the nomination of his party. He did it without the help of party insiders. And you really need those insiders once you get to the general election. So the, 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 the consequences of doing things one way in the 
primary process are playing out in a particular way in the general election. Okay, but this is just one example from one state, uh, but I think it does point to the importance of this network of party officials. And uh, without it, uh, Trump is at some disadvantage. This is a free resource that comes along with being the nominee of a major political party. You have a team of people who can go out and campaign on your behalf. The other way that parties are effective is in helping the campaigns in the field, as we say. That is on the ground, organizing volunteers, distributing yard signs, making phone calls, knocking on doors. Uh, those are things you can't do by running TV ads. Those are things that don't happen automatically by holding a rally or some other event in a state. This is really the, the hard, ugly work, often behind the scenes, of organizing offices in the field, uh, particularly in swing states, where we think they're gonna be most needed. So I wanna give you a sense for how that looks this year. This is one portrait, uh, again from 538, of the number of field offices by both the Clinton campaign and the Trump campaign across the states. You'll see that there's a field office in at least, you know, in almost every state, um, but there's also inequality in the number of offices. The blue circles indicate the number of Clinton field offices. The red circles indicate the number of Trump field offices. A couple things to note about this. One is the Democrats generally have more offices. They covered a wider range of states. And in the swing states, in places like Ohio, Florida, New Hampshire, Colorado, uh, the Democrats have more field offices in every case, in every case. Uh, that's been true in the last couple of presidential elections. It's not limited to the Trump-Clinton comparison, but it continues this year. Uh, there are also media reports to say that these Trump offices tend not to be very effective. Uh, when, when journalists show up to see what's happening in the field offices, in many cases they find that the Trump offices are not open or not functioning, or um, there are no staff there or the office um, exists sort of in name only, or maybe is, is something that actually the Republican Party is running. Um, that's one of the interesting things that's happened on the Republican side this year, is that the Trump campaign is not doing much in the way of ground efforts in terms of field offices, and is relying largely on the RNC, on the Republican National Committee, to use its existing field staff to help mobilize voters and collect the early vote and get volunteers out. The other thing you'll notice is that some of the Trump offices are located in states that we wouldn't think of as particularly competitive. In South Dakota, in Arkansas, and Mississippi, there are a fair number of Trump offices, and yet those are states that are not swing states. They're not likely to be up for grabs. Those are reliably red states in recent presidential elections. And it seems to me that what those offices represent is enthusiasm of Trump supporters on the ground who have helped to organize those offices in those states and not, not really intentional planning by the Trump campaign. Okay, so here's, here's a place where Trump is outmatched. Clinton has a better field operation by all accounts, but he's assisted by the fact that the Republican National Committee exists and had some pre-existing field operations before he became the nominee, and he's relying on those field operations to turn out votes and do the other things that are necessary to uh, to make his campaign a success. And we're gonna find out obviously on November 8th how that worked. So campaign field office is part of what parties can do to support their campaigns. One other aspect of the party politics in 2016 that's been unusual is the pattern of fundraising by the candidates. I mentioned earlier that Trump won the nomination in a really unusual way, essentially running, raising no money on his own and self-funding the campaign either out of his own pocket or from the Trump organization. Uh, that has now changed a bit as we've gotten to the general election. Just give you a sense of that. Uh, here's uh, fundraising by the candidates and by outside groups. The lighter bar in each case is the, the candidates fundraising directly. So as of last count, Hillary Clinton had raised about $373 million. Donald Trump about half that at $165 million. In the darker bar are outside groups that are connected to the candidate in some way. And again, the Clinton campaign is ahead by a, a factor of two or three, about $145 million compared to $40 million for the Trump campaign. We don't see disparities like this in most presidential elections. 
the rolling assumption is that you arrive at a general election with two well-organized, well-funded, uh, well-resourced campaigns who are going to compete on pretty level ground when it comes to the resources that are needed to mount a campaign. And that's not been the case. The Trump campaign has been playing catch up uh, through most of this general election cycle uh, with field offices, with endorsements and other things. And here you see it in fundraising. It's also true if you move beyond the candidates to look at fundraising by the parties themselves, uh, both the Democratic and Republican parties and the DNC and RNC plus other committees in Congress are also raising money. Uh, there, the imbalances are less severe. Uh, the Democratic Party has raised more than the Republican Party, uh, thanks largely to Clinton's efforts, but the disparity is not great. And for the DNC and RNC, actually, the total fundraising amounts are about the same. So this looks to be specific to the Trump campaign and not necessarily uh, what the parties are doing more generally. Uh, but it is part of the process. And one hopes when you get to a general election that the presidential campaign and the party can run a coordinated, integrated campaign. Uh, the Democrats have been able to do that this time. Uh, the Republicans are, are not quite together in that same way. And again, we'll see what consequences that has once we reach election day. One other uh, separate factor to think about as we get to election day is just how much all of this is worth. If the Trump campaign is at some disadvantage, because it lacks endorsements, the Republicans are not as unified, the party is more fractured, it lags in field operations or in fundraising. You might think this is an opportunity for the Democrats to win a big one, for there to be a landslide that benefits the Democrats. But the data indicate that we haven't had many of those landslide elections in recent years, and we may be in an era in which close elections are the norm, and it would take a lot of those kinds of factors to push us away from that. Here are the margins of victory in presidential elections going back to 1952, so quite a string of about 16 elections. Blue bars indicate elections where Democrats have won the popular vote, red bars where Republicans have won the popular vote and the margins. And you can see some of the landslides that are familiar to us back in time. The 1964 presidential election, for example, Democrats uh, won that election by more than 20 percentage points. The 1972 presidential election, that was a Republican landslide for Nixon winning by more than 20 percentage points. Uh, but after that era, you'll see that the bars generally dampened down to a smaller magnitude. The last time a candidate beat another candidate by more than 10 percentage points was in 1984 in Reagan's reelection landslide. Since that time, including the Obama election, which looked like a triumph for the Democrats in 2008, the margins have been small, uh, sometimes uh, just a couple of percentage points, but never even as much as 10 percentage points. So to reach that level in 2016 would be pretty remarkable. Uh, political scientists generally explain this dampening of the swings uh, with the idea of polarization, that in the electorate, uh, there's been a sorting out of people's views on issues and their partisan attachments and their ideologies such that those things are no longer in conflict the way they used to be. Today, people who call themselves Democrats in surveys also tend to call themselves liberals, also tend to have pretty liberal policy positions, and tend to really approve of the Democratic candidates who are running and really dislike the Republican Party and its candidates. And the same thing holds on the Republican side. Republican voters, now very loyal, conservative, endorsing of their candidates, and really disapproving of Democratic candidates. And in that environment where the parties have moved apart and are distinct and uh, tend to have negative feelings about the other side, there just isn't much room for elections to swing wildly from one side to the other. There would have to be a tremendous imbalance in the perceived quality of the Clinton campaign and the Trump campaign this year for that to happen. Okay, so the, the lack of party apparatus or the divisions in the Republican Party might be great, uh, but they're going to have to be really severe, maybe more severe than I'm even portraying here today, for there to be a, a swing that puts us back into landslide territory of the 60s, 70s, or 80s. Something to keep in mind as kind of context for judging the election results in November. Uh, no discussion of parties in 2016 would be complete without thinking about the minor parties. 
Uh, this year is a little unusual in that there are a couple of minor party candidates who are having some success. The photo there shows you Jill Stein, who is the Green Party nominee, and Gary Johnson, who's the Libertarian Party nominee. The Libertarians are actually on all 50 ballots plus the District of Columbia this year. No third party has done that in about 20 years since Ross Perot was on all 50 ballots back in the mid 1990s. Uh, so there's an opportunity. Uh, the Libertarians also have a, a ticket of two former Republican governors. These are very credible candidates who have actually held statewide office and belong to one of the major parties at one time. Uh, together, these candidates are polling at about 10 or 11 percent. So something like one in 10 voters uh, are indicating they're interested in voting for one of these minor party candidates this year. And they may well swing the election. They're, they're doing well in some important swing states and could be the difference makers. But I want to highlight a couple of the reasons why political scientists think uh, there are real difficulties for third parties and, uh, and independent candidates in U.S. elections. The first is there's this classic idea in political science known as Duverger's Law, named after a political scientist, Maurice Duverger. Uh, his law was that in a system like the US, what we call a first past the post system or majority rule system, uh, single member district system, that that design tends to create a two party system. Indeed, the American political system has been dominated by two major political parties since the 1860s. Occasionally, a socialist, a Green Party candidate, uh, a, a progressive or populist candidate will have some success. There have been eras in American politics where that has happened. But essentially, the design of the system encourages a two-party system and discourages minor parties from hanging around, even after a successful election. In contrast, Duberger says, most other democracies have proportional representation. That's a system where a party gets representation in government that's proportional to how it did in the vote. So a party that gets 20 or 25% of the vote in a parliamentary system often ends up with about 20 or 25% of the seats in parliament. In contrast, when Ross Perot got 20% of the vote in the 1992 presidential election, he got exactly zero electoral college votes and his campaign uh, didn't, and his party didn't last much longer. So this is the major factor that political scientists would point to to say why minor parties have a difficult time, why voters sometimes feel as though they're wasting their vote or throwing their vote away. Uh, it's largely Duverger's law. Uh, but there are also other disadvantages that get in the way of minor parties. Uh, ballot access laws present a real difficulty. Every state has a different set of rules for how a candidate gets on the ballot. It takes often millions of dollars and many thousands of volunteers and a lot of organization and lawyers to make sure that a candidate can get on the ballot. That explains why the Libertarians are the first to get on all the ballots in such a long time, and, and Jill Stein ended up missing getting on the ballot in a few states. Uh, the presidential debate inclusion rules are such that it's difficult for a third party to get on the stage. Uh, Johnson was the closest this year, but he would have needed to be polling at 15% in five recent national polls in order to appear on the stage. That's the standard that the Commission on Presidential Debates, uh, a private nonprofit group, uh, decided on. And he didn't meet those standards and so didn't end up in the debate. And that's typical for a presidential election year. Uh, campaign finance laws are written in a way at the federal level that makes it more difficult for small parties than big parties. Major political parties automatically get federal matching funds if they wish to take them. They, that is, they get taxpayer dollars to help fund their campaigns if they want to raise money in a particular way to meet the standards that the Federal Elections Commission sets. In contrast, minor parties aren't eligible for those funds up front and have to first run an election, earn at least 5% of the vote, and in doing that, qualify for funds that will be given to their party after the election. So they essentially have to raise the money separately or run debt and hope that they can make that 5% threshold and get some funds after the fact. And then lastly is the idea of there not being a, an infrastructure for minor parties. Donald Trump has the advantage of having an RNC that already exists and has a field operation that he can rely on without having to put his staff into the field. Neither the Greens nor the Libertarians have anything like that. And so they would be at a severe disadvantage the way all minor parties would. So th these two uh, characters are important players in this year's election. 
we're going to see just how much when the votes come in, uh, but they do have a number of forces that are, are going to present some difficulties. Okay, let me talk about one other issue before we wrap up, and that's one that's been in the news over the last uh, five days or so. On Friday, uh, a shocking video of Donald Trump's comments was made public, and that roiled the political the Republican Party and his campaign over the weekend and was the number one issue talked about in the presidential debate on Sunday. That has caused some Republican officials who eventually came around to endorsing Trump to change their minds and say over the last several days they've decided not to endorse Trump. Senator John McCain, for example, who's running in his own election this year in Arizona and is a former uh, standard bearer for the Republican Party, had endorsed Trump in the general election, but has now said he can no longer do so. Uh, about a quarter of Republican elected officials in the Congress and in governorships have backed away from Trump. And um, it, it looks like less of, a, of an organized team than you might expect in a regular election year. One question is, who are these people? Which Republicans is it who have decided not to endorse Trump or to back away from him at this point? This is one analysis uh, just over the last few days about who those folks are. Um, the, the two lines you see sweeping upward from left to right indicate the probability that a Republican member of Congress defects from endorsing Trump. In other words, these are people who jumped off the Trump ship, so to speak. And you'll see that it's strongly related to how Democratic the district is. On the left-hand side, you have districts that are very Republican, where Obama didn't earn very many votes. Those Republicans are still with Trump. They've endorsed him and they've stuck with him, so very little chance of defecting. It's a low probability. But as the district becomes more competitive, as you move to the right, particularly as you get close to that 50-50 line, those would be the most competitive districts where the Obama-Romney vote in 2012 was about equal. There you see a strong uptick in the number of Republicans who have decided to go their own way, as Paul Ryan has let them do, and uh, an unendorsed Trump. And it actually becomes a majority of Republicans once you get to the districts that uh, Obama won, uh, a, a small number where there are, are Republican office holders, but nonetheless some. You also see differences between male and female office holders. Republican women are much quicker to unendorse Trump than are Republican men, even if they represent districts of a similar type. So this is where you see the tension between the goals of individual members to pursue their own policy interests, to make activists happy, to win office and keep office versus trying to maintain the collective goals of the party, to have an integrated message, to have a collective ticket, and have success up and down the ticket as you get to the general election. The fracturing you're seeing over the last few days around this one incident reflects really deeper-seated divisions within the Republican Party that are just coming to the fore uh, because of, of Trump's particular way of campaigning. Okay, with that, I'm going to wrap up our webinar. Uh, I hope this has been informative and helpful for all of you. We've touched just on some of the issues that political scientists would think about in a presidential election season and how they connect to this particular one where Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are the nominees and represent particular configurations of interests and concerns within the two parties. Uh, I wish you luck in teaching your students during this important campaign season, and thanks for spending your afternoon with me. can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I can. Looks like you're still recording okay. also. Yes, I am. So I'm going to stop that. <laughs>